God, we thank you for Amanda and for the gifts and talents you've given her. Pray that you would bless her as she brings a presentation. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that it wouldn't just be information, but a challenge to go and do likewise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Jake. <laughs> okay, so as I'm doing some research on Lucretia Mott, um, I was tasked with uh, finding important women from world history. Um, and I chose to do an entry for a book on Lucretia Mott um, from a universe of several hundred women. I thought she was particularly interesting to me because even though she's beyond my time period, I, I'm, I hang my shingle as a colonialist, um, though I am a, an expert on women's history, she's the 19th century. Uh, different constructs, different social implications, different things going on in history. But she really resonated with me because she was a woman who was... <laughs> She did not want to speak. She did not want to be eloquent. She did not want to champion all the causes she did. She did so because God told her to. She was, as, as Charity said, she was a friend um, at a time when um, friends had yet to split. Um, and then she was involved from the very beginning over the questions about that split. Basically, it broke down to, um, one group wanted to have, uh, wanted to be completely free of slavery, and the other one said, well, we should leave it up to personal choice, because for many of us, our money is tied up in slavery, tangentially. While they did not own slaves themselves, they were, many of them were merchants, and the most powerful among them had connections to, to subsidiary things, like they were dealers in cotton, and you couldn't deal with cotton unless you dealt with slaves. Anyway, so I find her to be remarkable because even though she did not want to stand and speak, God told her to, and she did. And she lives this incredible life where people listen to her. I, I should add at the outset, she's only about, she's less than five foot tall, and she only weighed 74 pounds. So she's a teeny tiny woman. And God said, go talk to people, go tell them things. And I think because she was so unintimidating, people listened to her. Large numbers of people listen to her. Okay, anyway, so we begin with the world in which Lucretia Mott lived. I think we need to talk about the social constructs and what's going on in society to understand why working in the first half of the 19th century was such a radical thing. Right? So she's a mover and shaker, roughly 1820 to 1880-ish. Until the 1820s, Quakerism remained a single denomination, but began to fracture over how to best address slavery and whether any action beyond personal avoidance was necessary. In the 1820s, the society underwent a radical split, and Lucretia Mott, like other friends, faced the challenge of which community to belong. At the heart of this controversy was your friend and mine, Elias Hicks, and his followers known as Hicksites. Among other beliefs, the Hicksites criticized Philadelphia leadership for using their power to silence those who didn't agree with them, for placing the authority of the Bible over the authority of the inward light, and for their continued financial connections to slavery. So for Mott, really what it broke down to for her was the stance on slavery. Notions of 19th century respectability, even as they allowed for the opening of women to participate in reform efforts as authorities on respectability, they also presented challenges to reform efforts. Popular social belief said that women could and ought to police public social ills, as it was women's responsibility morally to uplift society out of social decay. However, they needed to do so while still remaining within women's sphere, lest they transcend notions of respectability. In the 19th century, women could not attend college. And if women could not attend college, there was very little possibility of participating in the professions. So let's break that down. That means doctors, lawyers, teachers, ministers, except for some very small few elect people like the Society of Friends, right? And doctors were all men. So if you were a woman having a baby, if you were a woman needing to have a gynecological exam, you went to a man. Maud faced the challenge of speaking to a public that believed women had the moral obligation to uphold virtue, but could only do so if safely protected within the home. Furthermore, women could not attend many of the same meetings as men, such as the abolitionist meeting in England in which Maud met Elizabeth Cady Stanton. 
Only a select few women were permitted to attend that meeting, but they were not able to fully participate in it, and they had to sit in the back. Women's public meeting itself was suspect. For a woman to speak at a, what they called a promiscuous meeting, a, a meeting in which men and women were in the audience, was highly censored and taboo. Many women just couldn't. They couldn't take the societal pressure, and they stopped reform efforts. Many men bristled at the idea of female leadership. I know you're shocked. <laughs> when, for example, Mott and others sought to join Garrison, other men walked out and formed their own groups. So women could not vote. Women could not sue in court. If women were married, they could not own their own land. In the 19th century, the law basically washed out women's identity. In the 19th century, coverture still covered a woman. Um, so a man who was married to a woman, he legally covered her in terms of the law. She didn't exist. So she owned no property. She, if she worked, she, she commanded not her own wages. In the lies of the, awe of the law, she didn't exist. Racial attitudes also presented a challenge to Mott. Mott worked tirelessly to see not just an end to slavery, but actualization of equality for African Americans. So she's way out in front in that. Where most reformers are like, yeah, slavery is bad. They don't see equality for African Americans as being something to, to attain, to work for. So even among reformers, Mott was way out in front. And she faced residing resentment from white Philadelphians again and again. Uh, this is the, the burning of um, a hall that's, that Mott was speaking in. Um, she gave an address, and then protesters lit fire to it. Um, and she asks the leader of the, it's funny, she asks the leader of the ringleader, of, of, the, of her detractors, if he would, because he doesn't realize who she is, if he would escort her out the door and, and make sure she was safe. He says, of course, ma'am, I would be honored to do so, because all he sees is a very short, older woman who seems to be this embodiment of femininity, lest you know, he realizes it's actually the person he's protesting. <laughs> Another hurdle to the realization of equality was the racism of the reform women themselves and their reactions to the 15th Amendment. Later on, after Mott has been working for a long time to secure the end of slavery, so she's working in favor of abolitionism, there's a question, um, even in the midst of that, as to how far rights would go to African Americans. Of course, you remember, the 13th Amendment freed the slaves. The 14th um, made them citizens. The 15th gives them the right to vote. And white women argued about the response that they should have to the 15th Amendment. Should they, should they support it because it didn't give them the right to vote? Or did, should they work against it because they said, unless we're included, we don't want it at all? The women's suffrage moment, uh, movement split over their reactions to that. And the side that Mott was most closely aligned split against supporting the 15th Amendment. Um, the people that she'd been working with with a long time, her friends and allies, were the head of that movement. And even though she didn't support what they had to say, um, they, they reached out to her. So Mott was a fierce advocate for racial and gender equality and a proponent of peace despite these challenges. Mott indicated that, that central to her view and understanding of women's authority was her upbringing on Nantucket. I have this slide up here because, well, I thought it would be interesting to see what they wore. I, I, I like to know what did they wear, what did they look like? If I was alive then, what would I be wearing? We have this idea in our minds that friends of women in the 19th century were somewhat dowdy, wearing all black. It's a misnomer. I mean, she, was, she became a merchant's wife, and she was the daughter of a ship's captain, so she would have been well-dressed. Um, simple, by then standards, but still wearing nice things in color. Mott indicated that central to her view and understanding of women's authority was her upbringing on Nantucket. Her father, Thomas Coffin, was a ship's captain on a whaling vessel, and her mom, Anna Folger Coffin, ran a shop on the island. With so many men away for long periods of time due the to the necessities of whaling, the women on the island necessarily took on more responsibility than was common elsewhere. 
Moth's experience then, as she got a little bit older, she was sent away to boarding school. So she has this upbringing where she sees women, powerful women, making decisions every day that direct the finances and the affairs of their community. And her upbringing on Nantucket, she's surrounded by a sea of very vocal Quaker women because that's who's on Nantucket in the early 19th century. She's sent away then to boarding school, and she goes to Nine Partners Boarding School. And this is also a fertile ground for where she creates her ideas about fairness and equity. And it provides at least one opportunity to put her resolves to the test. In this environment, she heard and agreed with the ideas of Elias Hicks, one of the school founders. According to her biographer, he was a tall, gaunt man with a beaked nose and piercing eyes who would occasionally electrify the calm of Quaker meetings with his fiery denunciations of the sin of slavery and the spilled blood of human denigrations and defilements. He also emphasized the connection between God and conscience and of their duty to end slavery writ large throughout society. It wasn't simply enough to not own slaves. These ideas and his resolve to not rely on products in any way connected to slavery found fertile ground in Mott. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, at Nine Partners School, she also experimented with the ideas about taking these ideas and putting them into action. She heard of a, of a male classmate who was, in her view, treated unfairly, and he was being punished for something that she thought was wrong. And they punished him by putting him in a closet and not giving him any food. Again, not recommending these punishments, just reporting the news. right? And she said, this is not right. And so with her sister, she grabs food in the, in, and clandestinely shoves it under the door to, to, to feed the poor boy. Right? Because she said, I'm not standing for this, and I'm going to take action, even though it might cost me something. She also learns later on, um, as she gets older and she becomes a tutor at the school, first unpaid and then paid. She realizes even at this school that talks about equality and fairness and co-education that women are paid less than men, a significantly less amount than men for the same job. And this disparity really appalls her. So this upbringing, coupled with her Quaker faith, helped to germinate a resolute independence within Mott. She believed in a more egalitarian society, one in which power and authority were derived from the truthfulness of one's argument rather than one's social standing. In that sense, Mott believed that ordinary people could speak extraordinary words and cause ripples of change in both the church and in society writ large, if you just listened. Instead, her beliefs helped fuel and shape her activism. She believed that a woman could be directed by the inward light just as well as a man. And if she could undertake the same work as a result of that direction, she was entitled to the same rights, privileges, and pay as a man. Moreover, Quaker theology from the beginning espoused that God could use weaker vessels to bring powerful messages as a way to show his glory. In that sense, women were essential partners in delivering messages of truth and redemption. And there was no belief in a woman's perceived weakness or frailness that would necessitate limiting participation in political affairs. In fact, women, she believed, that were enlightened by the truth had an obligation to work for justice, equality, which Mott so ardently fought and sought for, and they could be useful tools in that task, not just an end in themselves. In 1818, oh, too far. In 1818, at 12th Street Monthly Meeting in Philadelphia, Mott rose for the first time to give what became the first of many public addresses. What connected the sincerity and depth of her belief and with the need to champion them publicly, however, may have been attributable, at least in part, to a very personal experience. Right? She didn't rise to give st because some abstract political thought um, it, it energized her. She rose because I think she was grieving. Her firstborn son, Tommy, had died two years earlier, and she wrestled with it a long time. Um, her, it changed her personality. What do you do with that kind of grief, that kind of despair? As she searched for an answer, a reason, she wrestled with depression and with her place in the world. And she picked up a book while she was still grieving, right? Sitting, she talks about sitting in front of the, em the empty cradle, reading William uh, Channing, the founder of American U Unitarianism, with his plea for human concern and for the role of reason in religion, and it struck a responsive chord in her. 
See, Channing said that duty was the greatest gift of God to human beings of whatever station in life, and that obedience to the inward monitor would lead a man or woman to perfection. So to some degree, her dogged determination to fiery rhetoric were a means of finding a new pur purpose amid grief, working to change the lives for the better of many people who needed her help after she could not help one who partially defined her purpose to that point, gave her meaning. Her first target was then the national sin of slavery. Mott's resolve and her cool-headedness at times helped to lend courage to other women with whom she worked for abolitionism, especially when attacked. For example, four days after attending the founding convention of the American Anti-Slavery Society, Mott helped found the interracial Philadelphia Female Anti-Slavery Society, radical because it was both black and white women in leadership positions at the same time. Despite being located above the Mason-Dixon line, Philadelphia had economic and social ties to slavery. So Mason-Dixon line, everybody south, grows the cotton. Problem was, Philadelphia at north, people are buying and selling the goods that connected with slavery. So they're still being driven by the American institution of slavery. They're making their money off of the transportation of cotton. They may not be growing it or owning slaves, but they're making hand over fist of transporting it. As a result, the city was deeply divided over slavery, uh, especially over anti-slavery. This not only was the female anti-slavery group that Mott organized radical for its existence, it was more so in that it was integrated. Rather than diminishing the woman's resolve, the public reaction of violence, remember, it burned, they burned down the building she was in, emboldened them. Mott began to entertain her black friends in her home. So it's just a sidebar because I think it's a really amazing story. So this angry mob has just burned down Independence Hall, right? They're on the way to find Maude because now they realize, oh, yeah, the little old lady that we helped escort out was the woman we don't like, right? So the angry mob has mobilized. They're out in the streets. They've got torches. It's the middle of the night. They're going to pull down buildings because that's what the mob does with their bare hands in the 19th century when they, when they want to show that they're angry. So they've just ransacked one person's house. And then one of her friends gets into the group and yells at the top of his voice, and on to the Mott's, right? Because he's leading them away from the Mott's house. So the only reason her house doesn't get burned down is because when they're standing in front of it, they hit this friend of theirs misdirects the group and they follow along a different way. I think that's kind of amazing. That's not it. That's right. That's not the right house you're looking for. Let's go find it. Right. You got it. Mott's deep commitment and command of the Bible and Scripture helped her to defend women's equality and justify the presence of female speakers more generally. On December 17, 1849, Mott delivered a speech entitled Discourse on Women. While that ex extemporaneous, as were all Quaker addresses, was highly reasoned, she first advanced all the scriptural arguments for the equality of men and women. As for St. Paul's injunction against women preaching in the church, it could be explained by the excited conditions of that particular church at that particular time. Elsewhere, St. Paul had set for a list of regulations for women to follow when, not if, they preached and prophesied. Mott's point was that God created equality between men and women, and whatever hindrances existed to limit women's participation in the professions should be removed. In her public addresses, Mott relied on the striking contrast between her virtuous femininity and her anti-slavery radicalism. As a very short, diminutive, matronly Quaker, not quite five foot high and 72 and a half pounds in 1872, she appeared the embodiment of 19th century womanhood with its emphasis on traditional Christian virtue of piety, humility, submi submission to authority, and a commitment to perform virtuous acts. In fact, another biographer writes that Mott's was hailed by her friends as pious, as benevolent, as self-sacrificing, as the perfect 19th century grandmother. The cult of domesticity pervaded 19th century America. It, it exalted the idea of the woman as sort of the angel in the house and the, the person responsible for bringing society up from moral decay. 
And as she did in her sermon to the medical students, I put that here, Mott used reason and example to contrast moral purity to the moral corruption of slavery. And she used her femininity to justify her challenging rhetoric. In her persona and her motherly concern for the young, unaccompanied male medical students, she gained the right to challenge the belief in slavery as a means of saving them from moral failure. In other words, her fiery radicalism came wrapped in a shawl wearing a Quaker bonnet. Mott's activism was aided by the timing in which it, it happened. She gained traction among Americans searching for a solution to the nation's social ills. Americans were nervous about massive changes underway that threatened the very notions of what it meant to be an American. Immigration, industrialization, urbanization, and a perceived increase in a rise of social denigrates, to name a few. As another historian explains, for a great number of middle and upper class Americans, the anxiety about the nation's moral standing demanded a religious response. Torn between optimism and fear, Americans turn to religion in numbers and intensity that have not been surpassed before or since. Further, her participation within reform movements, whether it be anti-slavery, women's equality, the peace movement, or something else, offered her a deep sense of belonging and community. This fellowship was the fuel that enabled her to keep working for justice. In some respect, it served to regain the loss of the tight-knit community Mott experienced when her family moved away from Nantucket. This fellowship helped to embolden her and strengthen her and energize her efforts, even when more traditional sources of community wanted her to limit them. So how did she change the world? For Mott, her conviction in the justice of the anti-slavery movement and the belief that she had a responsibility to speak when prompted led to a very vocal public speaking career. Mott delivered her first public address in 1818 at 12th Street's monthly meeting and continued until 1880. During the more than 60 years of public speaking, all without notes, as was her custom and the custom of friends, she championed multiple causes often at the same time. She spoke as God moved her. Mott was an early pioneer as well in the quest for abolitionism. Oh, too far. And a champion for peace. And she didn't just end there going, okay, abolition has, has been gained, that's it, I'm done. Right? She's working for, she's looking for equality. Mott personally helped minorities. To her, it wasn't just, I'm going to put the ideas out there and other people can put them into practice. It was a very personal commitment. As when African Americans came to her door asking for food or shelter, she gave aid additionally on an institutional level, like when she helped to support what the historical actors called colored institutions, like homes for the aged, orphan asylums, and other aid societies. Mott consistently championed equality for African Americans. So there's a, another story where she's in her own community on a streetcar, and the streetcars were segregated, even though it's, the streetcar is, is going to um, a military base for African American soldiers. The streetcars themselves are segregated. And if you happen to be on the same car, then women, then African Americans had to be on the outside of the car in the open air compartment. And it's pouring rain, driving rain. The conductor stops the car and tells a really old African American woman, um, probably in her late 80s, um, for the, old for the time, because, well, that, that's pretty old for the 19th century. She tells that that woman has to go and sit in the air even though it's driving rain. So this, to, Mott talks about this grandmother being asked to move. And Mott says, I will not stand for it. So she gets up and stands and sits with the woman in the open air compartment as well. And this changes the conductor's attitude and his, and his treatment. He then says that they can all come back in. And so she's able to affect change on this very personal level. But she's way ahead of her time, as I said before. Equality for African Americans wasn't on most activists' radar, not in the 19th century. Mott's speaking career became, uh, began excuse me, in defense of abolitionism and was radical in that she regularly spoke with authority to audiences of mixed genders. Among white abolitionists, Mott was perhaps the earliest and most consistent proponent of immediate abolition and racial equality. She was vital to the abolition of slavery, 
Her call to attention raised the public awareness of its lack of humanity. It and her own conduct inspired change. However, the reason she's not counted today among the pantheon of anti-slavery heroes has less to do with her actual contributions and more with the gender blindness of the movement's historians. When men at the end of abolitionism, right, when slavery is ended, when they begin to write their own history, they leave her out because it's being written by men who at the time just discounted women's contribution. And that legacy has come into, into the 20th and 21st century, where when you think about today who, who were the real forces beyond, behind the anti-slavery movement, Lucretia Mott is not usually one that comes first in people's minds. Um, people think about garrison. People think about um, those, those kinds of, of, of movers and shakers. But Mott was right there doing radical things. Mott was a co-organizer of the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. She had championed the current social status of women and the need for improvement. Patterned after the Declarations of Independence, the Declaration of Sentiments, which the 150 attendees signed, stated the following rights were self-evident, and that all men and women, all men and women, were created equal. This first women's rights convention demanded major social reform and the right to vote. However, the, right, the fight for women's suffrage did not remain unified. As I explained before, there was a split in which women would support or not support the 15th Amendment. So it's somewhat ironic that the group with which Mott is particularly well known today is perhaps the one that she was least comfortable with at the time, the suffragists. A biographer explained that the reason for this is due to the feminists co-opting her legacy, the then feminists, co-opting her legacy to try and give their nascent community legitimacy. By tying their cause to Mott, they hoped to extend some of her anti-slavery legitimacy. Dovetailing Mott's image as an iconic proponent of justice to that of the NASA, the National Women's um, Suffrage Association, connected their, that her justness with the justness of their cause. So they wanted to show that they were right, and by connecting Mott, who was right in defense of anti-slavery with them, suggested perhaps to other people that they were right. Mott had long advocated equality between men and women. One lasting legacy of this emphasis was the creation of Swarthmore College, with, which her family, family helped start. The college began as an experiment in co-education and continues today, the tradition of civic responsibility into the 21st century. Again and again, Mott showed herself to be willing to put her action to convictions. Mott and her husband moved to Cheltenham in 1857. They named their farm Roadside. It's here. In early January of 1863, the army leased part of a neighbor's farm and opened Camp William Penn, which became a training factory for colored troops. Even there, Mott fought racism, as when I suggested earlier that when she discovered that the horse-drawn carts and the trolley system brought passengers to the Chelton Hills didn't permit black passengers to ride with white passengers, she suggested they create a committee to look into it and to fix the problem. While not successful, Mott continued to fight for racial equality. It became even more important to her at the end of the war, of the Civil War, as she witnessed an influx of African Americans into Philadelphia. Many were poor, many were unemployed, and very many were in need of aid. She responded by becoming involved in practical assistance again and again. So it's fitting then that the first integrated community, first integrated um, the first integrated suburban community is named in her honor, Lamotte, and it was developed on the site of the former Camp William Penn. It's, it was developed and named in her honor because of the activism that she did in her own community to work for justice. So what does Mott's life mean to us today? Well, I need a space there, since it's <laughs> What does it mean? Is it just interesting information? Does it do anything? What do we do with this? Well, I think Mott presents a strong example for us about what can be accomplished when we look, listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. She didn't really want to be a speaker. She didn't say, let me stand here and tell you about how I'm wonderful, right? She didn't want to do any of that. She 
wrestled with her place in the world and whether she had something worthy to say, whether she, whether she was actually hearing God's voice or not. But again and again, she stood because she believed that God was telling her she had something that he wanted her to say something. So she wasn't giving the message. It was God telling her, I'm going to use you to speak my message. She could have said, I'm too old. There were times where she was looking for another young woman, someone maybe half her age, to take over for her. There were times where she was too cold, where she was too sick. She suffered from dysentery. Um, she, she suffered from one ailment after another. She saw many of her friends die, her family members die. She outlived a great number of people, but she didn't. And, and again and again, she answered, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will stand and I will speak. Yes, Lord, I will use my reason that you have given to me to help other people understand. And she didn't do it in a way that was in people's faces. She just said what God wanted her to. And I think that gives me hope, personally. It gives me hope that when I'm not sure if this choice or that choice is the right one, if I've really heard the voice of God or, that, or, or I, I haven't, when I listen to God, when I hear his voice, that's all I have to do. I have to do the next right thing. And that's what I think Lucretia Mott did. She did not a long view about this is my agenda, I'm going to do this and this, and then I'm going to champion for that. She didn't come up with a plan. She just said, I'm going to do the next right thing. And for me, she is a very powerful hero of the faith, somebody that I can look to and say, yes, God was faithful to her until the very end. And she lived more of a life than most people. She did more because she was willing to be used by God to do more than most people. And I think she found him there listening, and she found him there. I like this idea, the idea that, right, even as she was spending all of her energies, pouring herself out to be used by God, he was revitalizing her and energizing her, which isn't to say that we don't get tired when we work for justice, when we, when we do what God wants us to do. But I think it's a different kind of tired. I, I think it's a tired that comes from knowing that we have done the right thing as a good servant. So it's my thoughts as we, as we end. I think that relationship and sense of mission fueled her to the very end. While she was a loud and dynamic speaker in a teeny tiny body, she stayed quietly listening to what God would have her do. And in that way, she outlived many both with age, activism, and feelings of accomplishment. And God used her in ways beyond the scope of her imagination. And I pray that for us too, that God would use us in ways beyond the scope of our imagination.